Welcome to Casual Friday. So I have some knitting news updates. I have some, my knitting history research uh, for this week, some project updates, and then I'm gonna answer some uh, questions that you've asked me in the past few weeks. If you wanna jump from section to section, there are always timestamped links down in the video description. So let's get started. So I think it was last week that I told you, maybe it was the week before, but sometime in the past week or two, I mentioned that F&W Media, who had declared bankruptcy in March and filed for Chapter 11 protections so they could um, keep going long enough to, to auction off their holdings. Um, F&W Media owns Interweave Press. They own actually a lot of different craft uh, publications as well as uh, hobby publications like golfing or photography, astronomy, things like that. Uh, things with, to do with collectibles, Writer's Digest, just a ton of different sorts of niche publications. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, Penguin Random House bought their books division, so that would include interweave books. And then this past week, they had an auction for what they called their communities, and that would include things like website businesses, uh, conferences, and most importantly, all of the magazine publications that fall um, within their domain. And in, again, the biggest holdings within there were craft publications, including the Interweave magazines. And I write for three or four of the, the Interweave magazines. So I was particularly interested in the outcome of this. And so last week, rather than all of the communities going to one bidder, they were kind of chunked out based on interest level of particular uh, groups that wanted to see those communities continue. The large majority of the craft communities were purchased by Macanto invest, Investments. From what I can understand, Macanto or the guy who owns Macanto was on the board of F&W, has been on the board for the past couple of years, and his investment company had purchased part of F&W. So, so somebody who had been involved with F&W continues to be involved with the craft communities. So I'm not really sure how it all, it's all going to work out, but uh, they're not, nothing's going belly up yet. So that's good news. So last week in my never ending quest to prove that grafted sock toes existed long before Lord Kitchener's name got got stamped on the grafted sock toe. I found a knitting book. I showed it to you guys last week. It was a little knitting book called The, the Second House of Knitting, I think it was called. And in there, it had a pattern for a seamless sock. And this particular sock didn't even have a heel. It was one of those sort of like a spiral a sock, except it wasn't spiral, it was, it was direct, it was just straight ribs, but it had a grafted toe. And, and there was a note in there that said, that said or claimed that this particular type of sock had been knit for soldiers who served in the Crimean War. Well, I was just happy to find that this was printed in a book in 1902. And so since then, I've been kind of looking to see if I could find any evidence of printed patterns, like knitting for soldiers types of leaflets like they had in World War I, um, if there were anything like that in the, during the Crimean War. There's nothing in the newspapers, which is what I have access to, and I haven't found any knitting patterns. So I'm certainly finding a lot of knitting manuals that were published in the 1850s and that's when the Crimean War was in 1853 to 56 or something somewhere around there and so I hadn't been able to find anything I could certainly find mention in the newspapers that people were were knitting for the war effort and I found a couple of articles that just fascinated me because I didn't realize how many knitting 
garments and knitting terms came out of the Crimean War, but also some social history heroines as well. So there was this reporter for the Times, and I assume that it's the London Times. These, these uh, articles I'm reading assume that, that there's only one Times <laughs> newspaper called the Times. Um, so I, I'm pretty sure it must be the London Times. There was this Irish man who was a reporter for the Times, and he was sent to cover the Crimean War. And so he was considered a war correspondent, although he didn't particularly like that name. His name was William Howard Russell. And so he was writing these stories that would get sent, sent back and published in the Times. And it was the, apparently the first time that the public had any idea of what was really going on in the battlefield. And he would describe the kind of suffering that the soldiers went through, what it was like on the battlefield, what it, the surgery was like on the battlefield. And it sent uh, one woman, I'm sure you know her name, Florence Nightingale. She read about this and she went there and to, to nurse on the battlefield. And there was another woman who I will put on the screen. I can't remember her name. I'd never heard it before but she became really well known as well for also uh, going to the battlefields and, and helping to care for, for soldiers. So there is this one battle that was really famous in the Crimean War, and it was called the Battle of Balaclava. Balaclava is a knitted garment that we know of as a hat that's kind of got this little face mask part and it's got a, a neck all the way down. And the soldiers wore these under their helmets and they still wear things like this today. Like I can remember a few years ago, there were these charity knitting projects for knitted helmets for soldiers. And but, but they got the name Balaclava because of the Battle of Balaclava. Well, this, these reports that William Howard Russell was, was sending back to London created this outpouring of concern for the soldiers. And so women immediately began organizing themselves and getting school children um, to do this as well. They were gathering clothing supplies. They were making clothing. They were making stockings. They were making all kinds of of knitted items and uh, including socks and things that they were sending to the soldiers. This is when that became a thing in Britain is the Crimean War. From then on, when there was a war, they were knitting for the soldiers. They were apparently in the Boer Wars, which were in South Africa, where it was very hot. They were knitting, knitting things for the soldiers then as well, even though it was very tropical uh, weather. That was just some, that's the way that they contributed to the war effort. So the first Earl of Cardigan was commanded this, uh, this cavalry, uh, and the cavalry was called the Light Brigade. So it was the charge of the Light Brigade. And he had these instructions that were just terrible, and so things didn't go well. Well, the instructions came from the first Baron of Raglan, who was the commander of the army. So <laughs> Raglan had lost an arm in the Battle of Waterloo, and so he had his uh, suit coats uh, tailored so that instead of the arm ending here at the shoulder, which, you know, he had lost his arm, he had it coming all the way up to the neck. And so the raglan sleeve was named for him. And um, the, sold, the officers in the Crimean War uh, wore these knitted uh, waistcoats, buttoned waistcoats. So in the U.S. we call it a vest, a button-up vest, um, but the U.K. They, they would call that a waistcoat. So after the war, these garments became known as cardigans, named after the, the first Earl of Cardigan. Nowadays, of course, they have sleeves, and that's what we call a cardigan, but at the time it was the sleeveless waistcoat um, that, was, that was then renamed the cardigan in his honor. So in all of these pamphlets that I have been finding from World War I and World War II and in all these different things, they would have these little leaflets for knitting for the soldiers and they would call them knitted comforts. And a lot of times it was things that would keep the soldiers comfortable while they were in the hospital if they'd been injured. But it was also things to keep them comfortable when they're on the battlefield. 
And um, one of the things that, that they were talking about in the Korean War, this woman had written in her journal that she was knitting, arranging to, for the knitting uh, stockings and comforters. And I thought, I wonder what she means. I wonder if that's just another term for the, you know, knitted comforts, you know, like things that were warm and comfortable, or if it had a specific meaning. Because in the United States, a comforter is what in the UK you'd call a duvet. It's a thick, puffy uh, covering for your bed that is sort of like a blanket, but a bedspread too, because it usually has a color, it's colorful. It isn't necessarily just the cover for the thing. A lot of times it's, it's an all-in-one thing. But I know when I was living in New Zealand, comforters were what we would call a pacifier, something that little baby would suck on. So I was trying to figure out, well, what, what did they mean in the Crimean War era, what a comforter was? And, and I think that what they were talking about was a long wool scarf. But it was certainly something that was knitted in wool and warm. Um, what exactly it was, I'm not 100% sure. But some of the other things that you find in these leaflets for knitting, knitted comforts, uh, and that you'd seen the paper, they're asking for cholera belts. And I could not figure out what a cholera belt was because, you know, cholera is dysentery. It's like massive, horrible diarrhea. And I couldn't imagine what you could knit that would be helpful in that situation. And it turns out that they thought you could prevent cholera by keeping the abdomen warm. And so it'd be this uh, wide, or maybe it was narrow, but it was a long strip of wool, could be knitted or just fabric, and that you'd wrap around your abdomen um, to keep you, to keep it from getting cold, and then you wouldn't get cholera. And even in, well into the 20th century, when they had figured out what the cause of cholera was, they were still asking people um, to contribute cholera belts. I, I don't know why, but but they did. <laughs> One thing that I thought was interesting about how the Crimean War was the first time that British knitters knit for their soldiers, and I was, tr I was pondering that. I was thinking, why would that be? And one explanation certainly is that the that that war correspondent allowed them to understand what was going on in the battlefield. But I knew that in the United States that we had been knitting for soldiers really since the beginning and I was trying to figure out why and that the reason is is because our wars were on our soil from the beginning it wasn't until later that they were fought on on foreign soil so the wars that we fought the revolutionary war and war of 1812 um, local knitters were knitting for their soldiers but they they were they were local so it was they were very aware of what was going on so with the british soldiers those wars were being fought in colonies that they were trying to establish in very far off places they weren't being fought on their home soil at that time. So that helped give me some perspective on, on why we were knitting for our soldiers for 100 years before Britain was knitting for theirs. I was reminded of the fact that American knitters were knitting for American soldiers early on from someone in my knitting group who was talking about this book, No Idle Hands, The Social History of American knitting and I've had this book for probably 30 years and I go back to it every so often and with a different purpose um, for, for reviewing things but there's some really interesting thing in, things in here about uh, what women were doing during the American Revolution basically doing things like going door to door to collect money to solicit um, clothing and knitted items and, 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 ha and calling on the wealthier women to make sacrifices of not acquiring new clothing, but instead using those fabrics to make clothing for the soldiers. Um, so it's really interesting that the, you know, women were basically violating um, social norms by, by doing these kinds of things. But in the end, it turned out that everyone is really grateful to them for doing that. I have an update on my serviceable sweater, my World War I era sweater. And my update is that I have 
knit both of the sleeves. So I have completed all of the knitting for this sweater. Now I just have to do some sewing and some finishing touches on it. And then hopefully next week I can show you the completed sweater. But I did remember that I had promised to show you how the pocket was constructed. I have pockets on the front here and the pattern originally called for patch pockets. So you would sew these little kind of rectangles separately and then you would sew them on the front. And I don't like uh, the way patch pockets look. I don't enjoy the sewing on. I never think they look as nice as they could. So I wanted to knit an inset pocket instead. And specifically, I wanted to knit a seamless inset pocket. So I filmed all of the different parts of it while I knit the right front a few weeks ago, but I forgot to, to show it to you guys. So that's what I'm going to show you now. But first, I'm going to show you what the stitch pattern is. I've referred to it a few times as mistake rib, and I've explained that it's a, it's a knit two, purl two, stitch pattern, but it's a knit two, purl two stitch pattern that's worked over a multiple of four stitches plus one or four stitches minus one. So I'm going to show you how that worked first, and then I'll sh show you how the pocket was knit. So here is the stitch pattern that I'm working. It's a, it's a four stitch repeat called mistake rib, and it's just knit two, purl two. So I'm knitting two, and I'm purling two, but you'll notice that half the time I'm knitting a stitch, I'm knitting into a knit stitch. So this is a column of knits, I'm knitting it, but the next stitch is a purl and I'm knitting that one. Now you'll see I have a purl stitch that I'm purling, but the next stitch is a knit that I'm purling. But what's really going on here is that I have uh, columns of knits, and then flanking the columns of knits are columns of garter stitch. So those are alternating knit, purl, knit, purl up the columns. And then in the center, it's hard to differentiate um, what's going on in the center with what's going on on either side of it. But that's on the other side, it's a knit column. So it's a purl column. So I've got a column of knits, the knit columns are coming forward, the purl columns are receding, and then the garter columns flank either side of them. And these are not garter columns that are exactly the same as each other. You can see that up here, I've got a purl bump adjacent to the knit, knit column up here, but over here, it's, it's a row down from that. So these are offset uh, garter columns from each other. So this is a representation of the right front of the sweater. This is just the last few rows of the garter stitch border. I don't have all of them on this sheet. And this is going to be the button band where the cast off and cast on stitches are. So this is all the border. And then this is where I will be placing the pocket right here. So I, I wanted, the pocket is 23 stitches wide. It's 32 rows long with 10 rows of garter stitch. So I wanted to figure out how to place it on the front here. And these are the stitches I'll be decreasing out because um, I've added an extra repeat uh, on each piece. So this is the actual garter stitch bottom band. This marker right here represents where the button band is going to be so that I can make sure that I start or finish the garter stitch band uh, when I'm knitting between this edge and that marker. And then here is where I've placed the markers that define this pocket edge right here. So the first stitch of the pocket, there's 23 stitches between the markers, there's a 23 stitch pocket. So these markers are outside, right outside those 23 stitches. So this is my, the, the front, this is my right side row. I've got the smooth side of the cast on here and I've just finished row 12. And you can tell because I have, you know, the purl bump is, is two rows below. I've got knit stitches right below the needle here. So I've just finished a right side row. And what that means is I've got purl bumps across the back of 
the needle here. And that's where I'm going to add the pocket stitches. Across every one of these 23 purl bumps between the markers is I'm going to pick up a stitch. So I'm going to take my needle. I could use a smaller needle if I, if I was going to have difficulty. So I dive down into that purl bump and I make a new stitch. So I dive into the next one and I make a new stitch. So I do that across all 23 stitches. So now I've picked up all the stitches in between the markers. I'm just going to count my stitches to confirm. Yep, I've got 23. I'm going to keep these markers on the needle. I used them at first to mark where to pick up the stitches, but I'm going to need these later when I'm actually working the sweater and joining it to the pocket. The first row after this border I have charted out here, and I'm going to work the exact same pattern for the pocket flap. So what's going to happen on this needle right here is I'm going to knit the pot, the, these 23 stitches for the, the inset pocket flap. Now, normally for an inset pocket, the pocket would be knit in stockinette and it just makes it flatter and smoother. But because this was originally supposed to be a patch pocket, there was originally supposed to be two layers of the same exact mistake rib, one on top of each other, I decided to make the inset pocket the mistake rib as well. If I had wanted to do it in stockinette, I would stop the stockinette here and then I would have switched to the mistake rib right here so that when I work the front of the sweater back and forth and I'm working the garter stitch pattern in this area that when, when the, the pocket top kind of comes away from the front and you see down inside the pocket it would still look like this mistake rib. The reason I, another reason I decided to go ahead and keep this in mistake rib was because the rib pulls in a little bit and even though technically the mistake rib has the same gauge and should get blocked out the same as stockinette the reality is it's going to want to pull in a little bit and i didn't want there to be a obvious difference in i didn't want the the pocket itself the inset pocket to kind of uh, pucker weirdly or differently than the mistake rib did so i just decided to knit the pocket the same as i'm going to knit the front of the pocket of the pocket. I've just picked up stitches so now I need to turn and then I will work the first wrong side row of the pocket the same as the first row of the pattern is right here. One of the things that's important to do when working the inset flap regardless of whether you're working it in the stitch pattern or you're working it in stockinette is that the selvage stitches, the edge stitches of the inset pocket be worked in garter stitch. Now it happens that the stitch pattern that I'm working already has those stitches in garter stitch so I don't have to change or modify anything um, from what the pattern stitches but if I were knitting this in stockinette stitch I would still keep the edges in garter. Okay so I have finished the pocket lining and I put it on waste yarn and what I've done here is taken one of these old style uh, stitch holders and I picked up each one of these garter stitch bumps along the edge. The first pocket I did I put these bumps each on a double pointed needle and then as I would uh, work across the row and I would come to the double pointed needle I would slide that stitch and you know I'd work it off of that double pointed needle. Um, the problem was that it was kind of getting in the way and as I worked more of the front and I got up to here and I only had a few stitches left I was accidentally knitting together the sweater with garter bumps that were that were at the top rather than that were at this end. And so I wanted to try to avoid it somehow and I thought, well, if I if the only way to get the bumps off are through something like this oversized safety pin, maybe that would help. I'm not sure that I love this idea. I another option would be to simply thread each of the the bumps onto a length of waste yarn 
and um, and do that instead. I don't know. I'm going to see how this works. I need to put another one of the one of these, hang that off of this side, and then I'll I'll see how I like it. But this is what it looks like so far. So so now I'll be uh, working uh, the first wrong side row of the sweater pattern all the way across here, and then when I get to the pocket, I'll join that to there. So I'm nearly done working the front along with the pocket. So I've got markers all over the place because I'm doing multiple things at the same time. One is I'm doing buttonholes. So I'm keeping track of what row number I'm on because I know that in row 28 and 29 I'm doing a buttonhole, 48 and 49 I'm doing a buttonhole, etc. So I kind of keep track every 10 rows. I move this marker up so I can keep an eye on that. And then over here I needed to start decreasing out my extra stitches and I'm doing that every eight rows starting on row 32. So I was keeping uh, track of those things there. And then I have markers on the needle as well. This one is marking the end of the garter stitch button band. And then these two are marking the span of stitches uh, for the pocket on the front and the actual flap that I knit was on the back. So as I work across the front, I take the first stitch inside the marker and I knit it to a garter bump along the edge. And as I get to this marker here, I work this last stitch together with uh, a, a, a garter bump along this edge. So that was one more thing I had to keep track of was what row I'm on. So when did I switch from knitting this pattern to knitting the pocket top pattern as well. Before I do this last uh, joining, I'll show you uh, what that process is like. On wrong side rows, I'm just working across the stitches that are for the front of the pocket. There's no joining going on at all. Okay, so I'm about to work my final uh, joining row of the pocket. So I'm going to be joining it as I go across, and then when I come, come back in this direction, I'll be binding off these stitches. So I slip this marker over, and, uh, and now I get the, I, I put all these on a um, waste yarn instead of trying to use something that was metal and stiffer because it just made the pocket a little bit more flexible. So I come through and I grab the the bump that that waist yarn is on and then I just pull it out. So I, I put it on waist yarn. You don't have to put it on anything at all. It just, it helps me make sure that I, I'm picking up all of the bumps in the right order, that I'm not skipping any or somehow working some of them twice in a row, and just helps me keep my stitch count. So I'm just working them together as I knit two together. And then um, this is the garter stitch pocket top. So then I have the last stitch here. And it is on the waist yarn here. I'm gonna grab it off of there and then pull that waist yarn out. And then I'm going to knit these two together. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to work across the wrong side row once again. And then when I get to this marker here, I'm going to bind off all of the stitches that are sitting on the cable right here. And then I'll work to the end of the row. And then the next right side row, I'll work across until I get to the pocket. I'll put all of the stitches of the pocket flap that are resting on waist yarn, I'll put those onto the needle, and then I'll just continue all working the rest of the row. And then from then on, I'll just be working across all of these stitches and the pocket will no longer be involved. I wanna answer a couple of questions that have come up in the past few weeks. One of them was a question about 
uh, she made a comment that uh, she said, you, you seem to knit a lot and how do you keep yourself comfortable? Because she had been having to uh, lay off the knitting because she was having, I don't know if it was shoulder pain or elbow pain or wrist pain or, or something. And she was wondering how I did that um, and kept myself comfortable. And I would say um, there are a few things that, that I do over the years. I notice if a particular chair or knitting position or something ends up causing a problem for me. I also notice whether certain types of knitting stitch patterns or needle sizes or material fiber types are a problem for me. I, and I, the other thing is I don't really think I knit as much as some people think I do. I, I'm on, you know, on the continuum. I feel like I'm probably somewhere on average for an enthusiastic knitter. I probably knit a couple of hours a day. Some days I knit more and some days I knit less. And I've mentioned a, a number of times that on average I knit about 2,500 stitches a day. So if I were knitting a sock, that'd probably be about three inches. If I was knitting a, you know, the back of a sweater, it'd probably also be about three inches because they would be bigger stitches. So I, I make progress, but I, I'm not a speed knitter. I'm a, an efficient knitter. I work at a pretty, pretty good pace and I do knit for a couple of hours a day, but I'm not a speed knitter and I don't knit incredible amounts. In fact, when I was looking at that social history of knitting, I was reading about uh, this woman who, who was knitting um, just a crazy amount to knit stockings. You know, stockings, they come up above the knee. And her husband had calculated that she had knit 330,000 stitches in the previous six days. So, you know, that's more than, that's like 55,000 stitches in one day. That's like my, an entire sweater in a day for me. It would, it would be, it would just be impossible. It's like 20 times what I, what I am able to knit in a day. So I don't knit as much as I think some of you may believe. I, I'm sure I knit more than some of you do, but I probably also knit less. I've met people at the knitting retreat I went to last fall. There was a woman, she's retired, and she knits literally all day. She, eight hours a day, she knits. And I, I probably couldn't physically do that, but I also would get bored. I actually do get bored uh, with knitting sometimes. We were just out of town in Arizona over Father's Day weekend. And so there's travel time and then they're sitting around with your relatives all day long, just talking. And so I was knitting a lot and I knit probably 6,500 stitches in one day. And I didn't really knit the next day. I, was, I got sick of it. So anytime I knit way more than average, the next day I knit way less. So that's how I get this, this average of 2,500 stitches. I will say that when I'm knitting on small needles in an intricate stitch pattern, like that has maybe Bavarian traveling twisted stitch patterns where you're knitting through the back loop and then you're alternating between knits and purls and you're cabling without a cable needle, all of that causes me to have a lot more wrist movement than I would if I was just knitting stockinette. And that can really put a toll on my wrist. So I have to be careful with that. Uh, earlier this year, I was working on designing an, an, an Aran sweater, which I've kind of put to the side. But one of the decisions I've made about knitting that sweater is that I'm not going to knit continental. When I knit continental, then I cable without a cable needle because the cable needle uh, gets in my way. So instead, if I knit my old method, which is with a long straight needle that I anchor at my hip, um, the, and I throw, I'm much more comfortable with that. I, I think I can knit longer like that just normally, but uh, when I cable, the cable needle doesn't get in my way. And I think there's gonna be less wrist movements um, because of that. So I do look at what causes the toll, but really the thing that causes me the most sort of physical discomfort is writing. And it's when I'm doing a lot of writing and then following that with, with knitting that I get the most trouble. So I did buy a book that I'd heard about and I've glanced through it, haven't read it cover to cover, but it's written by Carson Demers. 
and he's a physical therapist who is also a knitter and he teaches these workshops at all of these different places all over the country. So any any time I've talked to somebody who's taken one of his classes, they've raved about it. So I, I bought his book. He um, self-published it. So I don't think you can get it on Amazon, but I will put a link down below. I bought it directly from him, but it's called Knitting Comfortably, The Ergonomics of Knitting. So he talks about sort of seat position, body position, arm position, uh, wrist position, how... Um, not just knitting, but all the things that you might do during the course of the day, how those all add, the kinds of things that can all add up to causing uh, you to use the same body parts in the same way. So that's, I think, why I have a trouble with writing and knitting. Uh, I haven't been able to figure out a good way to position my laptop. I probably really need just a different keyboard and a different uh, position for it, but I haven't bothered to do that. So I would recommend that if you're finding body pain, that maybe a, a book like this uh, would be helpful to figure out, you know, what might, what might work for you because I think everybody's body is different and everybody knits differently and the things that they knit are different as well. So I don't know that you can make a flat statement. Well, here's what I do and that's going to work that should work for you too because I, I don't think that's that's going to be the case. So just this afternoon, someone at, posted in the Ask Me Anything for Casual Fridays thread in my Ravelry group. She posted, you recently mentioned once owning a knitting machine. I was wondering why you chose to own one and why you no longer do. Earlier this year, I dove into the world of machine knitting and I am slowly learning how to use it and the river I added. I still hand knit, it's my zen time, but I like the speed of the machine when doing a lot of stockinette. So I actually still own my knitting machine, I just haven't used it <laughs> in many years. When my first daughter was born, I left the corporate world and so after I'd been home with her for about a year, I got to the point where I was ready I needed to do something um, besides just caring for my child. I didn't want to go back to the corporate world and I really needed, wanted some creative uh, outlet. So there were two things I did. One was I joined a writer's group as the local chapter of a national writer's organization for fiction writing. And the other thing I did was I happened to go on like a little day trip with my sister-in-law to, I think it was St. Peter, Minnesota to Mary Lou's, Mary Lou's, there, there's a St. Peter woolen mill and it's associated with this yarn shop, um, but it also sold knitting machines. But I was there with her and we were, I think we were coming down a stairway or an, or an escalator or something. And I saw these machines and I'm like, what are those? And she knew that they were knitting machines because uh, after she had finished graduate school, she had gotten a bonus at her job for something and then bought a knitting machine and had used it a number of times. Not recently, but she said it was fun. It was interesting to do. So I got really uh, intrigued by that. And I got interested in the idea of being able to do design work on a knitting machine. So I had little kids. Well, I had one little kid at that time and then I eventually had another one and I was really, I really enjoyed knitting for them. And I had all these ideas about things that would be cute uh, to do with just plain, it was just stockinette but color work, intarsia. And so I bought this knitting machine and I bought some software that allowed me to um, plan these, these color block patterns. And then I would knit them up and I really enjoyed it. And I thought, well, this might be an interesting business to get into, like making these little um, baby and toddler sweaters and then finding a way to sell them. And I really enjoyed the designing. And, and the, the one, th one thing that machine knitting taught me because I bought a, a reference manual for machine knitting that it had some techniques in there I'd never done in hand knitting. One of them was grafting and the other one was um, mattress stitch for seaming up. I'd never done that before because I hadn't had any kind of knitting reference book before. I just seamed the way that I would have seen woven cloth, assuming that that was the right way to do it. So I learned a few things in machine knitting that really helped with my 
finishing results. But it turned out that I really couldn't make any money. Like it just, there was no way, I would have been able to sell my sweaters, but I wouldn't have been able to make money. And I really didn't want to make, like I didn't want to be a manufacturer. I didn't want to produce multiples of the same thing. So that was one aspect that I'm like, okay, I'm not going to do that. Um, the second thing was that I had to be physically in a different part of the house in order to use my knitting machine. When I had little kids, that meant I either had to wait till they were, I uh, had a babysitter, or they were maybe at a daycare or their Nana had them for the afternoon. Um, some, or it was after they were in bed at night, then I could go somewhere and I could do the, the knitting. So that was a problem. It was a lot easier for me to carry around my hand knitting when I was taking him to the park or we were in a doctor's office in the waiting room. I could always have my hand knitting with me. But I think the main thing that was a problem for me was that I'm very tactile. That's what I love about knitting. I love holding the knitted fabric. I like seeing it, you know, holding it in my hands and, and creating it stitch by stitch physically. And with the knitting machine, I, you're not touching the knitting. It's hanging off of these hooks and there are weights pulling it down so that to keep it, to keep it on all the hooks. And then there's this carriage. It's this metal and plastic uh, piece of material that has a handle on it and you push it back and forth across the bed of needles and that creates each row of knitting. So you remove yourself physically from the act of of making this cloth by introducing this this carriage in between you and the fabric. So that was a problem for me. When I was knitting for my kids and I was knitting stockinette uh, sweaters, they were in a sport weight yarn. That's the other thing. With uh, knitting machines, you have, uh, there's a maximum number of stitches that you can knit. And you have a fairly small range of yarn weights that you can use for that machine. So I was knitting with sport weight cotton yarns and I could knit the kid sweaters. I could probably knit something for myself if I had wanted a cotton sweater, um, which I didn't. The nice thing for kids was that you could throw it in the wash and uh, put stain remover on it and stuff and, and it would be fine. But for myself, I wanted wool and I wanted something a little bit heavier and I couldn't knit for, say, my brother, who's a big guy. There was just, no, I couldn't do everything that I wanted with it. And also, for me, when I'm hand knitting, I really like textured, cabled items. And it's a lot harder to do that on a knitting machine. And you can do it, but you remove yourself even further if you're doing a knit pearl pattern, if you have something called a garter carriage. And so you're programming a, what the stitch pattern is into it. And then you leave the room and this is garter carriage. It's electric. Chunka, 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 chunka. It's very noisy. And it's doing all the knitting. You're not even moving the thing back and forth. The other option would be to hand manipulate all the stitches. So they're just... Uh, it was just not what I was looking for in knitting. And I do often think about returning to the knitting machine and doing some things with it that I hadn't done with it, say, 20 years ago. I mean, I just know so much about more about knitting in general that I could probably um, think it, it might be a good way to work out design ideas. I wonder if this would work and, and, then, and then try things out and I could get a faster, say, a faster swatch with that. Um, that's a possibility. Uh, I'm not going to say never because I, like I said, I still own the knitting machine. I just haven't taken it out in 20 years. <laughs> so in the past couple of weeks, I've mentioned that I'm going to be doing a sock knit along in August. I'm going to have full information about how the sock knit along is going to work coming up in a couple of weeks in early July. I should have that all nailed down. But you, it won't, you won't be knitting to a pattern, a specific pattern with a specific number of stitches. You are going to be determining the number of stitches that you need to fit your leg and how to customize the fit of a sock so that when you're done, you'll really understand how to fit a sock to your own foot and then can knit um, patterns that are designed by other people and know when and where to tweak those patterns. So there'll be more information, more full information about how the, 
knit along is going to work coming up in early July. So I hope you'll join me for, for the knit along. It'll be, I think it'll be really fun. That's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.